Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Gastro Girl Podcast. Today's episode, we are so lucky to have the amazing Emily Holler, a registered dietitian who's come on the show today to discuss IBS and the low FODMAP diet. Now, if you have IBS and you struggle with pain, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, any or all or one or two of these unpleasant tummy problems, there may be something you can do in the way of a dietary intervention. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Emily. She is a GI expert registered dietitian in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And she's passionate about active living, healthy eating, and optimal well-being. Now, Emily works as an outpatient dietitian with the Division of Gastroenterology at Michigan Medicine, where she provides individualized nutrition counseling and medical nutrition therapy to patients with a variety of gastrointestinal disorders. She's pretty amazing. And we're, we're so excited to welcome her to the show again. Welcome, Emily. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for having me in the introduction. It's great to see you. I'm excited to be here. Good. Well, you know, you're so well-versed in a number of areas of GI. And one of the ones where you really shine and where I noticed you first was really in your work with IBS and in particular, the low FODMAP diet. Can you give us just a little overview of what the low FODMAP diet is? What are the key concepts? Yeah, absolutely. So the low FODMAP diet is an evidence-based nutrition approach to help people with IBS manage their gut symptoms. So in short, it's a three-phase approach. It's not a forever diet. Sometimes we call it a symptom management tool or a learning diet, and it can help a significant portion of people with IBS improve and manage their gut symptoms through diet. So roughly research supports that about 50 to 86% of people with IBS will feel better or respond to a low FODMAP diet, which is great. That's exciting. It also means that it doesn't work for everybody because another 50 to 20% may not respond. But we know that many, many patients with IBS associate their gut symptoms with food. Um, and this is probably the best diet with the research behind it to show that it can help manage gut symptoms, which is really exciting. It's exciting as a provider. It's exciting for patients. Yes. And I'm, you know, I don't want to trump your wonderful um, intro to the low FODMAP diet that you did for GI on demand, which gives a great overview. Yeah. <laughs> but just give us like for all those people going, what is a low FODMAP? Uh, uh, what? <laughs> and what do yeah. I need to know about this? Yes. So surface level, I won't get us too into the weeds. FODMAP's an acronym and what it stands for is a mouthful. Nobody ever has to memorize it, um, but it's, you know, it's on the internet. It's on, it's on our handouts, right? So fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Again, mouthful. I'm glad we just say FODMAP. These things, FODMAPs are short chain carbohydrates. So they're short chain sugars or short chain fibers. They're found naturally in nature. They're found in certain fruits, vegetables, whole grains, certain nuts, some dairy products, some packaged goods. They're not bad. They just are. And because of the way that they're digested they're and because of their short chain length, they're highly fermentable. Our gut microbes ferment them. That produces a lot of gas that can feel very painful, can cause cramping, bloating, distension. They're also osmotic. They can pull water in that can speed things up and lead to urgency, loose regret bowel movements. So, you know, a whole host of gut symptoms and they, they're primarily seen to trigger gut symptoms in people with IBS. So people without IBS can eat high FODMAP foods and not experience those gut symptoms. Now, what's really fascinating here is that not all FODMAPs affect everyone equally. Yes. And that's why it's so important to work with a registered dietitian such as yourself who can walk you through or walk a patient through. There's three phases of this approach. Can you kind of give a little overview of what those three stages are? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So the elimination phase is where we have someone eliminate or limit the best that they can high FODMAP foods, and that's roughly two to six weeks. So it is short term, pull out the FODMAPs, 
assess if they feel better, assess what symptoms get better and to what degree, right? Because it might not always be 100%. And that's something in, you know important that we talk about in clinic with patients. It's something that's a part of the GI on demand low FODMAP course, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, but we're looking for a significant improvement in symptoms during the elimination phase. When somebody feels better, we know that they're a responder and then we would have them move forward to the reintroduction phase. And that's where they reintroduce by FODMAP group one at a time in a systematic way to figure out which foods sit well with them and which foods don't. Um, and in what quantities, because portion size matters, it's not all or nothing, which is I think good news um, because like, you know, if we have a food allergy, we have a peanut allergy, we're not eating any peanuts, but if we are, we'll use lactose intolerant, which is one of the FODMAPs, you know, there may be some lactose that a person can tolerate um, and they feel, you know, just fine. But if they exceed that amount, have too much, too big of a portion size, then it can trigger symptoms. So it's not all or nothing. And that's what we find out during the reintroduction phase, which is just so key. We do not want to stay in the elimination phase forever. That is not a good place to be operating from. And then the third and final phase is long-term management. It's bringing back in the foods that sit well with you, with that person, and limiting or avoiding foods that trigger gut symptoms. We talk a little bit about specific enzyme supplements in that phase, if you will, like based on what a person reacts to. Uh, and there's some other strategies at that point that can be used. Well, this is so great. And, you know, I like the fact that you pointed out that there's an elimination phase and then there's a reintroductory phase, which brings me to the next question. And I know you're big on this because I've heard your webinars before. There are nutritional deficiencies that could occur if a patient is taking out all these things and not knowing what to substitute that with or replace it with. So can you talk about some of the issues around nutritional deficiencies and what should patients be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is so important. Anytime we're talking about doing any elimination diet, we want to think about helping a person meet their nutrient needs. When it comes to low FODMAP, the good news is, is that the elimination phase doesn't cut out any one specific food group. And so what I mean by that is there are grains and starches, fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, proteins, whether it's plant-based or animal, lactose-free dairy or plant-based alternatives. So there's not like one food group that's completely eliminated, which is a strength in my opinion to the diet. And so when well-planned, the low FODMAP diet can meet a person's nutrient needs, both macronutrient and micronutrient. With that said, some studies have demonstrated that individuals on a low FODMAP diet had decreased intakes of several nutrients. So carbohydrate and fiber, which makes sense because FODMAPs are carbohydrates, uh, calcium, and then overall energy or calories. However, other studies have also shown that intakes remain similar between like baseline, what a person normally eats, and then going on a low FODMAP diet. Additionally, a, an important thing that I think about is a lot of our patients are not eating well to begin with, right? A lot of people with IBS right. are cutting things out on their own. They're afraid to eat. They're skipping meals because they don't want to have symptoms. So they may not be getting enough nutrition, enough nutrients in general. And in fact, Dr. Eswarn and colleagues looked at this and they found that many patients with IBS at baseline were falling short on key vitamins and minerals and that a dietitian led elimination diet actually improved nutrient intake. So there are some nutrients we, we want to be mindful about um, and make sure we're getting enough fiber, make sure we're getting enough calcium, but all the nutrients, right? And setting up that balanced plate, which can absolutely be done with a low FODMAP diet. No, this is so great, Emily, because, you know, we're not, we're not that we want to push all this work on you, but it's important for patients <laughs> to really work. Well, yeah, we do <laughs> um, push, it on me. push, push it on you or your, or your courses. No, but it's on, on all seriousness, you know, the role of a dietitian, especially one that is experienced with GI conditions is so important. And it's not to say you have to work with them, you know, every week, but just to really, you know, what you can do is to really understand 
um, at least talk with them at the in, at the onset when once you're diagnosed or if you're struggling to no avail, especially with IBS, and to see how something like the low FODMAP diet could help and look at alternatives to working with a dietitian, which are the courses we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit. But it's almost like working with Emily, only you could stop her and listen, rewind and listen to her again. <laughs> <laughs> and not have to worry about your hour being up, right? <laughs> I mean, we could really go back and kind of listen and 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 see what um, she said and really understand. And it is truly like like having you in our living room, um, helping us with this this low FODMAP diet. When it comes to managing IBS with diet, what do you think? And we kind of just talked about maybe one of them. What do you think are some of the barriers for patients um, for incorporating something like the the low FODMAP diet? Yeah, that's a really good question. I feel like probably one of the biggest barriers to implementing the low FODMAP diet is probably access to good new, good nutrition information or education or resources, primarily access to a GI trained dietitian, um, which I know is being, you know, worked on by GI on demand, hopefully will improve access nationwide. So that's, I mean, that's a major barrier. It can also just be so difficult and overwhelming, right? To have to like change so much at one time. So just like recognizing that, um, that can, that can be a major barrier. And again, having the support of a health professional that can help guide you through it, having support of friends or family to like, you know, just partner with you and support you on that journey as well. And then sometimes barriers to food, like food access in and of itself is huge. And so, you know, sometimes that might even precede the importance of doing a full on strict elimination phase, but, you know, again, not to get too in the weeds, sometimes it doesn't have to be followed perfectly to the T to work. So you can still, you know, try to cherry pick some high FODMAP foods out in the setting of maybe not being able to do a strict, strict elimination. And that may be of benefit to some people, but in general, we do recommend trying to do the full elimination. That's kind of the standard or uh, gold standard, if you will, to start with. No, that's great. And you have some amazing handouts for your courses too. And just knowing what foods are in the high FODMAP category. And if you know, like, I mean, I love lentils. I eat lentils all the time, but they can be kind of bothersome. And it wasn't until I started, you know, learning more about the low FODMAP diet that I realized that lentils have a pretty high FODMAP, but you can do things like make sure they're soaked and little tricks like that. Yes. And, and that makes a difference. I actually found them yeah. and it made a huge difference. So little things like that, yeah. you'd be surprised that, like you said, you don't have to do it to a T, but just to have the knowledge to know, oh, gee, I eat a lot of lentils and maybe there's something that I could do to mm -hmm. make it, you know, lessen the the uncomfortability that I feel when I eat them. So how long would you say it takes patients to see any improvement in their symptoms once they start, you know, down the path of this low FODMAP intervention? Yeah. So, I mean, one that is very individualized, right? There, there isn't like one set specific time that we know everybody will respond by, but generally speaking, it's going to be within that two to six weeks. If somebody hits six weeks and there's hardly any improvement, I do not think the FODMAP diet is for them, at least at this time. Um, and we ask that they come off of it. It doesn't mean that we're at the end of the road in terms of helping with gut symptoms. There may be other things to do with the diet, um, always communicating well or com yeah, communicating well with your healthcare provider is so important um, because we don't want to just stay again in that elimination phase, especially if it's not helping, right? If yeah. it's not helping us, we need to try to find something that does. I usually, I mean, some people do feel better within the first week. Sometimes it's the second. If we get to the third or fourth week and we're not feeling well, a food and symptom journal at that uh, point in time can be helpful. Oh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, just kind of jotting down. Sometimes there are even apps out there you can use that may mm -hmm. be helpful. Yeah, um, that's absolutely. great. So are there any other tips um, that you can share with anyone who may be ready to try the low FODMAP diet? Yeah, so we've gone over, and I would say the most important one, just understanding from the beginning that it's a three-phase approach, working with a GI dietitian for education and support, or just having you know good a good resource and handouts and materials, 
realizing that the diet doesn't have to be followed perfectly to the T for it to work. You just do the best you can. And I say this and always give the example, like if you accidentally or intentionally eat something high, say you're in the elimination phase, you're on week two, and then boom, high FODMAP meal comes into your day and diet. It's not like you have to start all over from day one or scratch. Like you know, you just do the best you can go low FODMAP, your next meal or snack, your, your FODMAP bucket, which we talk a lot about in the introductory webinar will still empty out and you're still going to gain valuable information from your experience. Um, because that, that, uh, desire to be super perfect with this. I, I think that's not a very healthy place to operate from. And that can be stressful. And we know that stress can exacerbate gut symptoms. So, you know, we want to have some flexibility. It's not, FODMAP free diet, it's low FODMAP diet. And then probably another tip is like a little bit of planning goes a long way. So okay. looking at the low list, thinking about what foods you want to create your meals and take it week by week can help lower some of that overwhelm that happens when we follow an elimination diet. So just thinking about the meals and snacks that you want, uh, planning ahead. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna cook something, maybe cook a little bit extra so you have leftovers throughout the week, I find that those are helpful tips when you're in the elimination phase. Well, Emily, your compassion that you show just in answering the questions really is what I want to focus on for our next question. Yeah. If, if you love how Emily is sounding right now and you love her demeanor, you will love these courses. She does an amazing job of really handholding you. No judgment, no ridicule. It's a paid course. It's a hundred dollars and it's three parts. So it's a great, it's a wonderful value for what you're getting. And like I said, you get Emily in your living room. You can stop, pause, go back and listen to what she says, but um, take us through a little bit about what this amazing three-part series has to do with. Yes. So it's three parts and the first part aligns with the first phase of the elimination diet. So it's going to be all things elimination, talking about how to eliminate and why is like a refresher for the amount of time. We created eight comprehensive handouts, which are meant to make sure that you have all the information that you need to get through this. So of course, there's going to be a high and low list, right? You need to know what to avoid and also, you know, what to eliminate or limit the best that you can. We have two specific handouts on those nutrients that we talked about earlier. So how to get fiber in the low FODMAP diet, information on how to set up a balanced plate, calcium sources on the low FODMAP diet, uh, an example or sample, if you will, of like using a meal planner with some sample meal ideas. So yeah, it's really designed to equip a person with all of the knowledge and confidence to like safely and successfully start a low FODMAP diet. The second module is about the reintroduction phase. So we talk about how and why to reintroduce. And that comes with a reintroduction worksheet, uh, a place where you would write down what you try and how much. We do have suggestions of what you could use for each group, but that's not set in stone. You really get to pick your own adventure and you choose which high FODMAP foods you want mm -hmm. and can add those back in. I'm going to go over, you know, again, what that can look like, because I do think that there's a lot of confusion about like, how much do I use and how many days and what if I have symptoms? And I mean, there is a lot of what ifs. So I really did my best to try to cover like the what ifs. Um, and then again, being able, I highly recommend, and this is in the module to write it down, right? You're going to write down what you try and how much, because that really helps when we go back and look at trends over time. In general, it it presents itself, your body is going to tell you. And then the third phase is the personalization phase. And so that is, you know, going into how to bring things back in, right? You've done these reintroductions, you've gathered information this far. So now what? What am I supposed to do with that? Do I just add all these things back in? What about enzymes? What do I do if symptoms flare up? And so we cover that in that module. And then there's also a worksheet for that. So there's eight handouts for the first and then one for each for the next two modules. That's awesome. And you also give these amazing little tips and tricks as well, like with garlic, you know, there's a little trick with the garlic. 
Yeah, uh, oil. I, I remember yeah, all this stuff. Yes. Absolutely. See, I remember all this, but Emily, thank you so much for being here today. If you're interested in a deeper dive into the low FODMAP diet, check out the free webinar that Emily did on GI On Demand University by visit, visiting education.giondemand.com. And also she has that amazing three-part series. You can also find it there. Thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to um, seeing you soon. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.